Uh, so today we're talking about the future of protein. Uh, and it's obviously a very interesting topic, first of all, because we all eat. Uh, so it's very close to our hearts in many ways. Um, and I think it's a topic that is interesting to debate uh, intellectually, uh, ethically. There's a lot of problems uh, with meat production just because the population is growing and we need to make sure that everyone gets enough protein. Um, and today uh, in Europe, there are some very, very interesting companies being built, but also a lot of challenges ahead. And what I love at The Family is that we support entrepreneurs uh, in their day-to-day -day of building companies. Uh, and there are a lot of challenges that are common in company building, like recruiting, like raising funds, like marketing. And we decided to start a new series of events, so this is the second edition, that is specific to certain industries, just because, so I saw a lot of you are entrepreneurs uh, in this sector, and that's really amazing, uh, very quality crowd. And the idea is for you to um, think about and consider the challenges, the barriers that exist today, and hear from the doers. So the entrepreneurs, the investors, the people that are actually changing the landscape, um, learn from them with me, and then you'll be able to ask all of your questions. Um, so without further ado, I would love to welcome our amazing panel. Uh, so Nicolo from Five Seasons, uh, Antoine Hubert from Insect, Bashak from Magic Bean, and Benoit from Arienco. And I'm so excited to have you guys. So please join me on stage. <laughs> and we give them a huge round of applause, please. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so thank you for, for being here during lunchtime. Um, so I did a really bad job at introducing you guys, so maybe you can do it better than me. Benoit, we can perhaps uh, start with you. Tell us who you are and remind us what you do, even though everybody here is kind of famous. So <laughs> go for it. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, hello, everyone. So I am Benoit Plisson. I am the, the co-founder of Ari Co with, Ema with Emmanuel. Uh, we are both food sciences engineers, and a few years ago, we take aware about the, the protein challenge and also all the food revolution is coming on with the consumer, or today, co consumer want to eat a uh, product more clean, uh, more want to understand what they eat, want to be more connected with the agricultural sector, etc. Uh, and uh, that's why we, we focus on, uh, on pulses and beans, uh, because for us, this product uh, gives the it's the global answer for all these challenges uh, because they are good for health, good for nutrition. They also answer on uh, environmental and agricultural uh, issues. And they, they, there are also no breaks in terms of uh, cultural habits. Uh, so that's why we, we, today with Ari & Co, uh, we do products like uh, uh, burger beans, like uh, no meatballs. We also have a, a ready meal uh, range of products, the super soup we launched a few few weeks ago. And all our products are plant-based, uh, mainly uh, beans-based, and um, there are no additive, clean label, and low process. You know what to have for lunch afterwards. <laughs> Bashak? Hello, everyone. My name is Bashak. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Magic Bean. Uh, at Magic Bean, we, uh, we develop and commercialize a plant-based meat. Uh, in, in very simple words, we transform pea protein and gluten to obtain a, a fibrous meat-like texture. Uh, so, um, and today we are uh, addressing food service uh, in order to render plant-based meat uh, a commodity, uh, a, product, a food product uh, consumed by, by everyone. Uh, so, myself, I'm, uh, I'm a doctor in uh, chemistry and material sciences. Uh, my uh, um, specialty is protein transformation. <laughs> I have chance. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I'm a biologist initially. And by doing magic bean, I'm solving uh, a problem of mine. Because uh, once I, was, I used to uh, eat in a, a company canteen where I, I had to eat meat Every, lunch, every, time, every day at lunch, and it was really disturbing to me. So uh, we are trying to solve this problem, uh, and it, we, I think we have a good beginning. <laughs> Great. Just a quick question. Who's a vegetarian, out of curiosity? OK, slightly overrepresented. Who is flexitarian? Great. Yeah. <laughs> More people. 
Okay, so these, these are people we are, we are targeting. <laughs> Perfect. So, Nicolo. Yeah, Nicola Manzoni. I'm the founder, co-founder and uh, uh, partner at Five Seasons Ventures. We are uh, a relatively new fund. We launched about a year ago. We focused, we focused exclusively on investing in, in food tech. Uh, but I've invested in food tech for the last five years or so. And, and in fact, the reason why I decided to launch a food tech fund was exactly because alternative protein and plant-based or cellular agriculture-derived proteins became a, a sort of an investment thesis in, in, in my previous job. And so I backed companies um, in the place where things happen first, which is, which is out west in California, where uh, companies like Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, created products and marketed products which uh, managed to sort of mimic what uh, the experience of meat really is and managed to scale at a pace which is more akin to uh, uh, tech companies as opposed to traditional food companies. Um, so I got hugely passionate about the space and I thought the, there's a wealth of entrepreneurs like maybe some people in this room which have ideas on how to disrupt the food uh, system and, uh, and at the same time there's not much specialized capital out there. So there's not much capital that actually knows what it takes to scale a business. You know, events like this five years ago didn't really exist and food tech was, uh, you know, kind of people sort of understood what it meant but they thought of food delivery mostly. And what we're seeing at Five Seasons is that, yeah, food delivery is still a big part of food tech. But of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a new generation of food tech companies that are popping up right, left, and center, which are really reinventing different, different stages of, of the food value chain and, and the food system. Just a, a few months ago, we published a report, which you can find at foodtech.vc, which is a dedicated website for it, which looks at the, at the state of European food tech. So you get a sense of what are the kind of themes that, that we, we look at. Uh, broadly across the food value chain. And of course, plant-based protein, especially in Europe, is a thesis that we have quite predominantly in our fund. We are uh, hunting for uh, startups that have the ambition, as Vladimir said before, have the technology, have the skills, have, have the motivation and products to really make this a mainstream category on the back of some pretty meaningful uh, consumer trends. So, um, Maybe I'm here to, you know, to add a couple of words on what happened in, in the U.S. Um, and uh, how that's being replicated or not in Europe and whether we need it or not. I guess that's a big question for, for everybody too. And uh, thank you for having me. Great, thank you. And I highly recommend the report. It was very useful for my research today. Um, Antoine. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Antoine Hubert. I'm the chairman and co-founder of Insect and CEO. Uh, insect, what we do, we farm insect, a small, small species called uh, molitor, and we process them into premium ingredients uh, to feed animals, uh, and today uh, carnivorous animals, fish, uh, from salmon to shrimps, and pets, so cats and dogs. And we also fertilize plants with uh, a byproduct we generate. Uh, we founded the company in 2011 to 2012, with three co-founders, Jean-Gabriel, Alexis, and uh, Fabrice. And uh, we scaled uh, from the uh, basic idea to uh, now having a small factory running for almost three years in Burgundy and building soon a very large plant uh, in north of France near Amiens uh, with the last fundraising we announced a few uh, weeks ago. And we are about uh, 110 people today. And I'm, my background is an uh, agronomist engineer. I'm also chairing the uh, European Association of Insect Producers. Very big topic on regulation. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, Nicolo, I'm going to take you up on, on your offer to paint us a picture of the European landscape. So you've been investing for five years uh, in the space. Uh, so I have a, a couple of questions. First of all, what has changed? So aside from the fact that we would probably not all be in this room together five years ago, um, what are the main, how have the trends shifted? Uh, and maybe drawing on what you've seen in the United States and how far away are we from that today? Yeah. So food tech, more sort of broadly speaking, came to um, the agenda, so the mainstream talk with food delivery, of course. You know, that's still a big part of food tech. Our report shows that it's, it's about half of the money that was invested, which is about 6.5 billion over the last five years in Europe. Um, and it's actually, it's actually yielded pretty good results. If you think about 3 billion, those companies now are worth about 21 billion. Some of them are listed, some of them got acquired. So it's been a pretty good investment thesis, at least. And I bet that most people in this room are users of some of those services as well. So, so you know, they're clearly going in, into into a certain uh, uh, playing into a certain need. 
Uh, what's really interesting is, is actually the other three billion that was invested, so the other half of the capital that was invested over the last five years in food tech in Europe, which has gone into other areas of food tech. So this includes sort of upstream agricultural technology uh, 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 innovations and companies, early stage companies, but also processing and, and, and transformation companies, and then even further down to the consumer products uh, space. So I think this is painting pretty, pretty you know, broad brush, brush picture. I think if you compare it to the, to the US numbers, Europe is obviously still very much lagging behind, but I think you know, let's not fall in the, common, in the common trap of just looking at venture capital funding as a proxy of how much innovation is out there. I think you know, it's obvious that US companies raise boatloads of money, in most cases too much money. Uh, it's, it's obvious as well that talent costs way too much in, the, in California, especially compared to Europe, but it doesn't mean that the skills, the skills are not there. Maybe the missing ingredients sometimes is the ambition, as Vladimir was saying before. But, uh, but Europe has had some, uh, some really, really interesting stories already, both from a venture capital standpoint, like for example, Antoine's company raising a massive, I think it's the biggest round outside of the US, one of the biggest in the world in, in the space. So kudos to Antoine and the team for, for setting a precedent there. Uh, but, but you know, we're gonna see more and more. And I, I still, despite being an investor, I still don't think that raising money is the name of the game at all. You know, we, we as venture capital industry, which in some places is really a bad word, like tobacco or alcohol, you know, you have raising money is is an enabler. Then it's really about it's really about what you do with it. It's really about really building something meaningful that changes that changes something. So I think I think an ultimately ultimately you know being a potential acquisition target or an IPO target for some of the some of the incumbents. So in Europe, what we're really excited about Five Seasons is is really the next gen what we call the next generation food tech companies. We made a few investments in this space already in agri-tech and, and pet food. Um, uh, Plant-based is, is, is a topic that, as I said before, we're quite interested in. I think, as always, you know, things start in California first, so the companies that I got exposed to invested in in California starting five years ago, where sort of they slammed open the door for alternative proteins to be really an interesting area. You know, and back then people thought, and even myself, I thought this is a product for vegans and vegetarians, of which I'm not, neither of them, and I was not even a flexitarian back then. Uh, but, uh, but they've really shown that there is a lot of latent consumer demand for these kind of products, because actually meat um, is, is becoming a bit of a bad word. I mean, like someone told me the other day, some investor investing in India, that uh, there is a bit of a stigma on meat, really like tobacco and alcohol, as I said before. But, uh, but, but I think and that, that's really becoming prevalent as well in, in places like Europe and the US. Um, you know, it is a fact that meat consumption is still on the rise globally because developing countries are driving some of that consumption. But there is this massive latent need for products which taste good. They're not a replacement experience that is sitting in the meat replacement aisle or the vegan aisle where nobody goes in supermarkets or only vegetarians and vegans go, which remain a small percentage of the population. But for products which taste good, they're at the right price, they provide a good, convenient experience, they cost the right, the right amount of money, and the consumers are really asking for. Thank you. And just to uh, ask a follow-up question, you mentioned that venture capital money is probably not a good proxy for how interesting what's happening in Europe is. What would be a good proxy for you? That's a good question. I think the best proxy is how fast you can build a company uh, as big as possible. You know, and you can use different metrics, if you know revenues and how profitable you build those revenues. And I think this is where Europe has a real opportunity compared to the, one of the places where Europe has a real opportunity compared to the US, where it takes a lot of money to build a big company in an unprofitable way still in the US. Some examples of recent IPO listings of Beyond Meat, for example, show that, despite having invested in Beyond Meat. Uh, uh, you know, they burn through crazy amounts of money. While in Europe, we're seeing companies that have pretty sizable revenues, or, you know, and they're quite young, you know, 10 to 20 million revenues in plant-based protein, never raise venture capital money, profitable. Which is, which is, in a way, it's a limitation because those entrepreneurs are solving for the wrong thing. Sometimes it's good to sacrifice profit for growth. But at the same time, they've shown maybe, you know, with the tailwind of so much consumer demand for these kind of products, they've shown that it's possible in this category. It is in plant-based protein, it is, it is possible. And so, so that for me is a proxy of success, how, how you build a company as big as possible, as quick as possible. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, so that was uh, super interesting in terms of setting the landscape, figuring, our, figuring out where we are right now, um, and picking up on something you mentioned. Uh, today, most of the unicorns that have been created in Europe in the space uh, are still in, in delivery, so Deliveroo, Delivery Hero, Caldo, etc. Uh, and what the amazing opportunity we have here today um, is to hear about the new generation of companies and figuring out how you revolutionize um, the entire chain. Uh, what I want to do today with you guys, if that's fine, uh, is talk about all the different barriers, um, all the different challenges that you guys as entrepreneurs and you as an investor um, have to tackle uh, every day. And the first big one, I think, is regulation. Um, so Antoine, my, my, my question is for you. Uh, so you created the European uh, Associations for Insects, EPIF, yeah? Um, and it's one of the first things that you did, one of the first things that you had to do. So first of all, can you explain uh, the rationale behind that um, and maybe give us some insights about what's really outrageous uh, in regulation today uh, that we might not know not being in the industry ourselves? But first of all, we, we are in a very... Uh uh, conservative and really um, uh, organized uh, industry. Um, I mean, food safety is the first concern every day uh, in, a, in your company. In the food, we, you, we are not selling uh, furniture, you sell something, uh, and if it's not uh, good and safe, uh, people can be sick, uh, people even can, be, can die. I mean, we, you, you are accountable for the, for the safety of your, the consumers and also of your, your people, also when you are manufacturing your people, uh, not being injured during the process. So food safety is key, and all regulation is here to protect the people. And in Europe, we have a very strong um, policy to protect uh, the consumers, which is good for the food, overall food safety, but in terms of innovation, of course, can also reduce, uh, like in the US, where the people, they let people inventing and then they come after if you, if you do uh, something bad, they could, uh, the FDA can come and, and close the, the activities. Um, so the, indeed, it's quite stringent, but eventually you, you need to include this from the beginning, uh, this full safety standards, and know perfectly the European regulation. Today, everything almost is at European level, almost nothing at member states, France level, of all these food safety topics at the European level. So you need, for your product, to really first know where are the topics and to know perfectly well uh, if, uh, you, how your product and your process could be impacted by the regulation. And we found out in our case that we were in a very big topic being the micro crisis. If you remember 20 or 25 years ago, it's maybe a long time for a few of you uh, being at this age, uh, but the, all this uh, big disease with all the cows and ships the, the dying in France and UK mainly, uh, and after this, they decided of a feed ban. So, because the the, the topic behind was cows eating, cows basically uh, eating a, a, a feed that includes byproducts coming from slaughterhouse where uh, cows were uh, slaughtered, and you you get some uh, byproduct, meat and bone meal, and then you re you use them in the feed given to cows. So that was the the basic of the of the issues and this uh, protein prion uh, uh, disease. Uh, after that, they decided to ban all animal proteins. No animal proteins in any animal feeding, from the cows to the sheep to the, to the, to the fish and poultry and pigs. When we came after, in a, well, we came a few years ago, later, in 2012, 2012 and we, 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 we screened all the, the, the legislation. We have been to the ministry, of uh, the French Ministry of Agriculture, so don't hesitate also to connect with the local regulation bodies. And, we, and we, we saw with them that insects are actually in biology animals. They are invertebrates, not vertebrates, but still all the laws uh, uh, done for animals uh, were the, then uh, relevant for insects. And then we were under the feed ban because we were animals, so you cannot use these animals to feed other animals. From this, uh, it was very potential, uh, very uh, big uh, uh, end of the story uh, in a way, or uh, just maybe a way to decide that we should go to another place, leave Europe, do something else uh, elsewhere. Uh, we, we, we had this, uh, this idea, but in parallel we decided to gather forces with uh, the few companies at this stage, uh, started to produce insects, uh, five. Uh, we, we, we created this, uh, this association because we, 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 we could feel that the regulation was done for big animals, not for small, and with some edu education and good arguments, we could change the regulation. 
we had this feeling and it and it, it, it was actually the case and it, but it took five years it took five years to be to be moved and to open the first market being the fish feed market and we are negotiating today uh, for the poultry market it's already one year work and at least two years ahead in front of us and then the pigs market so it's uh, you at least we could have also done a business model just focused on pet food, which was uh, an authorized market. So I would also ad advise to yeah, focus on the market that are possible today in the regulation and not do a full business plan uh, relying on some activities that could come, but that are really uh, linked to uh, uh, EU or, uh, or member state law. We were quite lucky also, it, it was fast and we were in a trendy thing maybe. But maybe in, on other cases, some topics could take maybe 10 years and then uh, you, you don't have time. So either you do a pivot, you leave, uh, you go somewhere else or you change your product or you focus your product to a market where at least you can sell. But it was, I think we, we were also lucky. I mean, I don't think we can copy paste our, our, uh, what we have done in the industry. But the, 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 the bigger say, uh, key, key learnings were you can work with your competitors. You can work together on non-competitive topics, join forces, because alone at this level it's impossible. So to, to do it, hire some consultant in Brussels and eventually we hire one guy with the, mem with the membership fees. We, we have uh, you know, two uh, employees in, the, in, the, in this association and uh, based in Brussels and uh, connecting with all the, the European bodies. Uh, so work with your competitors, focus on the market where you are, you are sure to be able to, work, to sell and try to see if you can do some amendments and to open and show to also to investors that your story is not limited maybe to a 100 million market, 1 billion market, but could be a, a 10, 100 billion market, uh, much, bigger, much bigger size, much, much bigger impact. And so this is why you did it, because from the beginning you knew you wanted to build something bigger than yeah. addressing the pet food market. Yeah. Because yeah, we, we have ambition, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. said. You have we ambition. need ambition, we have yeah. this ambition, because the DNA of the company is to make a positive impact on environment, and we know that if you are just small, you will never do an impact. You need to target something big, so this is the, the objective, and the mean to go there is to make a lot of profits, because without profits we won't be able to build factories and we won't be able to, to make a positive impact. Great. Can I just add one thing about that? I think what's remarkable about this is, is that uh, it's something that we've seen in other uh, topic areas as well, is that it's actually early stage companies, startups, which are now getting together to do something that would traditionally wouldn't do, which is lobbying. Um, and, and they're actually succeeding. It's, not, it's no longer the big corporates. I mean, they still do it, of course, but they fail in most cases because the regulator is looking at big corporates as um, uh, people you cannot trust in general. You know, in food or in agriculture. You know, I think I think everybody gets gets goosebumps when he when he mentions Syngenta or Monsanto in this room and complete mistrust of them. Not even talking about Kraft Heinz or Mondelez or Nestle. You know, it, it, there's just a huge mistrust of these companies, and so the regulator sees them as consumers not being favorable to the large food corporates or agrochem conglomerates. And so they are more open to receive early stage companies which have a mission, mm. like Insect and many others, uh, to do something better. And so they see this in, in more favorable light. So I think it, it, takes, um, it takes courage for a startup to do lobbying because politicians and regulators speak a language that we don't, we don't understand or we don't know how to influence. But it's, it's happening it's, and it's succeeding, like in the case of Insect, it's remarkable. Thanks, and it was also the other case. There's some geo strategies behind. You know, uh, Europe is depending 70% of its protein consumption for feed and food is coming from America, so from the US to to Argentina and Brazil for the soy. So they, they, Europe also understood that they had some with more innovation and more opportunities to develop by moving a bit this uh, a bit this uh, this European uh, uh, regulation. They could uh, open something and create local production of proteins that, and reduce go in this trend to reduce the, the imports so you because were, you yeah, you were really depending, really depending yeah. uh, on imports. Perfect. So maybe um, Bashak and, and Benoit, you can tell us quickly about uh, the, the process for you, wh how, what you lived um, uh, as also early stage companies uh, to bring your product to market, what kind of regulatory barriers you faced um, and what was the worst part of it? 
Um, so, so if we, with plant-based protein, we have, I think, more chance than uh, <laughs> insect because uh, there is not, not really regulatory constraints uh, about uh, our product because ingredients are well known and uh, so we don't need authorizations uh, to uh, to put the, the the food in the market. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we uh, it is plant-based and uh, versus meat, it is always like uh, we will have some. Uh, deficiency uh, if we if you consume a plant based and etc so, so what we did actually it, it was um, uh, we, we, we have met uh, um, the organization who rec who make recommendations to uh, collective catering companies in order to build uh, uh, menus uh, and also this is the organization who give uh, who gives um, uh, nutritionist, uh, nutritional recommendations, and we ask them to uh, put a new category of food in their guide, uh, which is plant-based uh, meat. So uh, this is, I think, uh, an important issue because uh, today it is, it is not plant-based meat is not really uh, has not his place its place uh, in uh, in these guides, uh, uh, nutritional guides. So that's what we have done, but. Maybe we need to do it together, <laughs> so then we will have more. Um, we can put more pressure on uh, on these organizations. Yes, uh, I join you, uh, Bazak. Uh, just to add, I, uh, today I think regulation really goes in the in the good way uh, about plant-based. Uh, in general, for example, uh, this year, uh, Santé Publique France released uh, new uh, recommendation. Uh, to eat more than two, two, two times uh, per week uh, more pulses and beans. And uh, today we are, we are very strong in food service and uh, what we can see is uh, uh, there is a lot of initiative from uh, local collectivity, from uh, institution uh, to, to eat more and more uh, plant-based meal because th there, is, there is a demand and, and these products are not... Uh, or everybody knows uh, beans, plant-based, uh, etc. For example, uh, we work with National uh, University uh, Canteen and they just uh, joined uh, the Green Monday. Uh, so it's a very good uh, indicator for, for us and there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, other examples like this. Perfect. Uh, so the next big barrier we're going to talk about uh, is technology, uh, which is probably a favorable barrier once you manage to pass it. And Antoine, this question is, uh, is for you. Uh, so what's really impressive in what you're doing uh, is actually the, um, the infrastructure that you're building. And I would love to hear from you what the biggest challenge in terms of technology for scaling the production process is according to you um, and how you think about, about that as a priority in your company today. Uh, it's, it's clearly uh, but the three bottlenecks were regulation, technology, and, and commercial also aspects. Uh, so we had to go through these three bottlenecks in parallel. Um, and for the, for the technology, indeed, there were no technology to farm and process insects at a scale where you could have volumes, uh, uh, where customers, you know, in, in the feed or the frost sector, the, the, the manure, they are speaking in thousands and thousands of tons of orders. It's not kilos, it's not few tons, it's uh, thousands of tons. So it's huge volumes at a very low price. Generally, it's few, it's few euros per kilo, so it's really a commodity market. Uh, and, but they, they, and then they ask for high, very high quality. Uh, ob obviously, uh, food safety, again, is a prerequisite. Uh, uh, and, and then performance, the product needs to be performant according to the, to the, to the price. So the customers always look for this. So Technology was uh, also a prerequisite to be able to produce the volumes at a good price. So we took uh, years and years to test and learn, uh, fail uh, on testing some technologies, but we were, we were actually also lucky to find the technology we had after just a few uh, uh, tests. We didn't test uh, hundreds of technologies. Uh, at some point we found one uh, with partners, uh, universities, subcontractors, sub engineers, uh, the, the, this idea of vertical indoor farm and, and then automating these uh, technologies coming from the retail industries uh, and, and apply this to the food business. Uh, and all this innovation step by step, we, we aggressively started with a, a, a IP strategy. Uh, today we have, we have 25 patents. We cover more than, more than I think 40 countries 
uh, we spend more than one million per year in patents, IP, uh, and it's a big, big investment because if you do a patent, you know that we will need to defend also it, so you need to include this, and we start already to, to push and have some uh, uh, litigious uh, uh, ac uh, actions and to defend our patents, uh, which is also a good indicator of the, of the strength also of our, of our patents. So it's covering pro process, product, and, and applications. But we, we, we had to, to develop this technology, we had to develop internally web subcontractors and, and innovation is, were, were in many ways and, and reaching this point of building a small farm, this, this, this demo plants, really gathering all the technology together, uh, almost three years of uh, learns uh, and then to be able to build a big one, we, a big factory we, we are going to do in three months in, in Amiens. The thing is, we, in our case, maybe we, we are doing two things. We farm and we process. Where there are two workshops, two different, very different technologies. Processing, uh, the technology are, are more, uh, uh, I would say, existing on the shelf. So we had to really integrate different technologies. Same for farming, which was much, in a way, much more complicated, coming from much more different uh, technolo uh, uh, industries. So if you can rely on existing producers, we call toll manufacturing, so companies that do for you, they have the equipment, they have the technology, they, and they rent the use of your, your equipment, or they do uh, 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 donkey uh, solutions for you. I think it's the best because it will save also capital and you will be able to produce your product on the market quickly. If in our case it was not possible, except for the processing, which is just a small part of investment compared to the farming, which is really a huge part, we had to invest. We had to to really to find the different parts and and gather them together on on this demo plant, and show it's already a, almost 15, 15 million investment uh, USD just the demo plant, so it's a very big one. So not, not as big investment as in California, but still it's a it's a it's a big one. Um, and but we had to do it to prove that at, at a, a real scale it's 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 working. The technology can work. Uh, we can get customers. So we are selling the product, but it's very small quantities. But we get orders, so we have more than 70 million orders today uh, from different com customers in fish, pets, and, and, and manure uh, applications, uh, fertil fertilization. So, so it was the, the, the good tool, the good size. Too big would have been too big investment uh, for a small uh, company. Too small, it, will have, it won't have been uh, relevant enough to show the, the, the effect after the scales would have been too big for the next step. So you need to find this, this scale up, step by step, from a lab to a pilot to a small plant, and use the maximum existing technologies, uh, standards, or, or toll manufacturing to, to reduce your capital intensity. I mean, what we do is maybe a, a one specificity is not the best uh, thing to do when you can use existing things on the, on, on the market. Super interesting. Um, so, Nicolas, to, to follow up on that, um, so usually the, the sign of a maturing ecosystem is that the infrastructure and also the technology infrastructure in place uh, is permissive to build new companies quicker and at a lower cost. Uh, is this, uh, so referring to what Antoine just spoke about, is this something that you've been seeing uh, in the companies you're meeting today? Uh, is it possible uh, to build companies like this uh, on existing tech stack? Yeah, I mean, yes and no, it really depends on which kind of company, right? So I think on this side of the panel, there are very capital intensive companies that have to do it on their own, as Antoine was just saying, and they can outsource small, low value added pieces to contra manufacturers. On this side of the panel, you have lower uh, technology burden companies that can use toll manufacturers and co-packers to make a product and then focus on the commercialization and the selling of it. And maybe in some cases, lobbying to be able to call it meat. I think, you know, tying back to the regulation point, you know, despite the product not needing any regulation, I think, not yet in Europe, I think, but in the US, we've seen a bunch of companies now lobbying to be able to call their products meat if they don't have, if they don't come from animals, or to call their product milk if it's based on soy or almonds or other things. I think that's, um, that's definitely coming because the meat industry lobby is big and powerful and employs a lot of people. And so they're going to they're gonna fight you not to call your product, product, not allow you to call your products meat. But I think, I think you know, the, the technology um, uh, profile of different companies is, is, is extremely different. So I think the, the, the problem and opportunity with food 
is that in most cases you have to make a, an actual tangible product. And so you are more innovative in the product that you're making, uh, the less you're using existing technology infrastructure for manufacturing. So in the case of insect, everything is new, right? So you cannot really outsource it to anybody else. In the case of plant-based meat alternatives, um, the technology exists. You can, of course, tweak it as, you know, you have a PhD in it or and you, you know how to do it. And lots of people uh, are tweaking the existing technology and building on it, improving it. Um, some people are even filing patents around it, whether they're defensible or strong enough, I don't know. But we had this discussion before as well. Um, but, but you can make a product and then focus on commercialization. So which one grows faster? I mean, in terms of revenues, if that's your proxy, the one that grows faster is the one that, of course, relies on uh, third-party manufacturers, existing technologies. But then again, the barrier to entry is lower. You know, we have two companies on the panel today doing very different things, of course, in terms of product, but sort of going after the same type of consumer. And there are several others. So the barrier to entry is different, and maybe the skill set to grow these kind of companies that maybe you're getting to the talent question is is less about manufacturing, about process, or it's more about product design and then commercial marketing, branding. Um, uh, whilst on the case of Insect and a few other companies, of course, it's more about creating something new and, and so, you know, learning the processes and, the t and creating a new body of science and technology is, is, is the key. And the final point, I think, even in alternative proteins, which I think is a type, yeah, the future of proteins, so it's not just plant-based. I think there are a few other technology platforms which resemble more the insect uh, model as opposed to the plant-based model which are, you know, cellular agriculture, taking stem cells from a cow, grow them in a lab and making a steak or a hamburger. That's, you know, that's also a new body of science, a new body of technology. It's something that has not been done before. So a higher barrier, but of course, longer time to market. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess the next question then is how do we make sure people eat the products uh, that you're making? Uh, and so we have uh, an interesting uh, battle uh, on my right. Uh, so you're tackling a similar problem, which is what is the new forms of protein? What will be, we'll be eating uh, after meat? Um, so Bashak, you're trying to create a meat substitute, meatless meat. Uh, and Benoit, you're trying to create different tastes. Uh, so can both of you, uh, you obviously have different views on this, uh, can both of you explain the rationale uh, behind pursuing the option that you did. Thank you. Um, I, so I think, yeah, there, there are different um, sources, new sources, alternative sources of, of protein. I think in the future, they will all coexist. I mean, uh, cereals, uh, plant-based meat, and also in vitro uh, meat, they will all coexist. I think we need all of them uh, because, uh, because we need diversification. We need a diversified diet. Uh, and so, Regarding magic bean, um, as we, our position, our main driver is sustainability. So, uh, the main driver is sustainability. So that's why I mean the choice of uh, plant proteins are important because it is yeah it's all about uh, soil health and fertility etc. Uh, on the other hand, we are addressing flexitarian people and we are trying to uh, convert carnivores in flexitarian people. Uh, so the the uh, the ultimate goal is. Um, a uh, increasing uh, plant protein uh, share in the plate and reducing um, uh, meat protein uh, in the in the consumer's plate again. So that's why we need to uh, we need to propose. Um, if we told ourselves, if we propose a plant-based meat, uh, which will be in the middle of the in the middle of our plate, which will be tasty, which will be uh, which will give uh, the culinary and gustative satisfaction uh, such as meat, then we will actually achieve the goal. We will be able to convert all those carniv carnivores into flexitarians. So uh, that's how we are trying to do actually. We are really combining uh, the source, uh, protein source, plant protein sources with uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, demand uh, about uh, culinary and gustative satisfaction. So I, yeah, perfect. <laughs> yes, I join also again Bazak. So I think um, uh, 
the challenge is, is more about how to, to build a sustainable uh, new food model, because protein is a big part of it, but it's not the, the only one. So first, I think uh, ingredients, uh, you have to take ingredients that are sustainable, for example, pulses or, or insects. You can cultivate, raise it all over the world. It's very important. It's not uh, require too much energy, too much water, too much fertilization. That's very important first. Uh, then uh, the product have to be uh, culinary, uh, for sure. Uh, we choose we choose the, um, uh, to to make low processed uh, food for marketing reason to meet uh, the the consumer today who want more transparency and want to be more close to the to the food that they eat. Uh, but I think it's also uh, a bigger uh, issue. Uh, because if you want uh, to scale your model, you have to you need technology while not uh, too much consuming about energy. Uh, it's uh, it's bigger problem than just uh, uh, if you have in your plate uh, this product or, or another. Uh, what they are behind it, I think it's also uh, very important. There are also the packaging. So what do you do today for our super soup product? We use a plant-based product. I think it's uh, it's a holistic, holistic a, a global. Uh, reflection around around it, and um, and be, after that, the uh, the communication to the the consumer is is very important. So we make the the choice to uh, to, to to don't uh, make our product look like meat because we we want to, we we think that today more and more people want to be more more green. So why don't we 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 put green? Uh, in your in your in your dish and how to, to communicate around it and how to educate uh, new new consumer and people who want to to change their habits uh, to to this kind of product. That that's a great segue into the the next big barrier if everyone is ready. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> so the next one is education. Um, the next one is education. And when we spoke uh, earlier, you mentioned that you had an interesting approach, which is to tackle uh, cafeterias, school cafeterias. Um, is that part of your big education program? So getting those consumers very, very early and forming a habit for them. Um, and how else can you think about uh, educating consumers today? Um, so maybe you, you can kick us off and then, and then we'll move to, to Nicolo to think about trends in demand. Okay. Uh, yeah. Today there are big trends. People want to want, want to, to eat greener and greener, and uh, we are very strong in food service. And uh, so for us, uh, the communication have to, to be around the uh, beans. Explain what what are the, the plants we eat, or what the, the role in terms of nutrition and uh, and culture. So we do a lot of uh, animation communication. In, in food service, uh, we teach to the, the people who serve the meal. You do animation? Yeah. Where, like, how does that work? Uh, we have some, some kits uh, who teach to the, um, to the people who serve the meal, for example, in school canteen. So they explain uh, what, they are, what, you, what you have in the, in the plate, why it's interesting to, to eat it, what are the benefits of the product, and all the story around it. Uh, and we also have some... Um, some goodies on the table for the for the children, for example, to to a uh, lot of explanation about uh, about beans, about uh, also maybe the brand if you can, uh, and uh, all the the challenge around the plant-based uh, product. And for us, it's very important because this con consumer are the tomorrow's consumer, and he, 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 it's also uh, uh, go from the the school canteen. Thank you. So, yeah, Nicolo, if you can maybe also draw from your experience uh, in the U.S. Uh, you mentioned earlier already that there's a lot of, of tailwind from consumer demand. Um, can you tell us a bit about how people have been educated, uh, maybe against their will, to change their tastes and expect something different in their plate? What have you observed? C can, I, can I ask a question to the audience? Of course. So maybe they wake up. Or to stay awake. <laughs> uh, usually, uh, these kind of events ask a question. You know, th th there's a trend which is alternative proteins. We're debating whether this is something that came from the consumers or products that were out there created, generated that need with consumers. So, can you raise your hand if you think this trend first is going to stay or go away? So, I'm going to start with staying. This this trend of alternative protein is this trend here to stay? 
Okay, keep your hands up. And oh, just keep your hand up if you're, me too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Keep your hand up if you are uh, not vegetarian or vegan. All right, so, okay, so the majority of, so the majority of people think, yeah, me neither, I'm not vegetarian. <laughs> so, so the majority of people think this is here to stay. Right, so I think consumer education or persuading consumers that having more alternative proteins or plant-based food is 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 good for you is is a no-brainer. I mean, I think I think most people in this room know, and if you're representative, which you're probably not, of the general population, then you know we all agree that this is this is important. So I think the question becomes: How do you provide excellent products so that people consume those on a regular basis? And I think when you go back to sort of the basics on why and how people buy and, and consume food, the traditional way of uh, the traditional criteria which drive food consumption and choice in supermarkets are in the order: taste, price, and convenience. So it's got to taste really good. It's got to be priced at the right price, uh, and it's got to it's got to be convenient. So I can you know unpack it, and I know how to cook it. I know how to. Uh, consume it and I know exactly which kind of occasions it fits in my life. So I think if you take alternative proteins then you have taste. You know now some of the products are pretty damn good. You know this You, you just products. tried the new Impossible, uh, impossible I, Last burger. week I was in San Francisco, yeah. I tried the Impossible Burger 2.0. It's mind-blowing <laughs> but you know these guys make really good products as well and I encourage you to try them and I think you know, try them with not expecting necessarily, especially in the case of Iron Co. to have meat, but think about these as a as a product food food product experience, and they're they're really good. So then the question becomes: Are you going to rebuy it? You know, because tasting buying a product to just try it out to have an experience as for the first time is one thing, and then are you going to rebuy it is another thing. You know, I've tried horrible alternative protein products like you know Satan steaks and stuff like that, which. I will never buy again, you know. It's, it's, so I think they have to taste good enough, you know, the products have to taste good enough for people to rebuy them. Price, you know, what's your price point? It's not far, it's actually lower than meat probably. But it shouldn't be because it's a premium product, so it should be higher than meat. So the, the perception of quality should be higher. And I think the education needs to be done on the convenience point, which in, in this case really means how do I cook this? You know, a, a, a plant-based uh, burger patty doesn't cook like regular meat. It cooks for longer or shorter or lower heat, higher heat. So I think that's the education that needs to happen. And that's where some of the U.S. companies were really successful in, in engaging the consumer, you know, and creating a tribe, which is not just a tribe of vegetarians and vegans, which are easy to catch, but a tribe in the broader population, which gives them this sort of social license to sell these products and, and, and uh, for those to be consumed in, in, in the right way. Yeah, and I think that Bashak has something to say about convenience. Just quick, very quickly, I can't resist. Uh, actually, so, so we, you talked about, uh, the, um, we talked about education, so we, people, consumer need to know how to handle a food product in order to cook it and, and in order to, uh, to, to have a good uh, culinary experience again. So. Uh, which, uh, actually, because I have this question all the time, this question all the time, especially I think in France, because we have a culinary uh, culture which is really, really uh, uh, related to, to meat, they, people ask me why you are trying to uh, mimic the meat texture. Uh, so I, I always give this answer uh, because people know how to cook meat, but they don't really have to handle pulses and cereals and we need to give them um, a solution uh, to let them uh, consume these products more and more. So what we are doing, and also Arianko, but we are a different approach both. So with this texture, with meat-like texture, we, we uh, give cons to consumer uh, and also to, to cooks a way to, uh, to, um, uh, to keep cooking like they cook every day uh, when they they cook uh, meat-based uh, dishes, actually. So I think with the product, we can kind of uh, bring, uh, solve the problem of education, because education, it's something really, uh, it, it costs a lot to companies, and it's, I think it's better to create maybe associations uh, to educate consumer and people. Uh, it's not really the mission of, um, of the company. So we are, we are trying really to solve this problem of education uh, with the product, with uh, the innovation uh, that we bring with the product. Great. Um, 
Thank you, Bashak. So the, the last big barrier uh, which we've uh, identified is financing. Uh, and so we brought this up uh, earlier already. Um, but I want to go a little deeper. So uh, Antoine, you raised a massive, massive round, which we mentioned earlier. You just raised $125 million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what has been your experience and uh, how, you know, how does financing uh, work in this space? Is it a typical VC case or not? And if it's a typical VC case, is Europe ready for it? Because these are huge amounts of cash to pull out. So how do you, what was your experience there? Uh, I think there, there is a, um, a way, uh, um, a pathway. We, we started with uh, VC. I mean, they, uh, when we started, they were not really food-oriented uh, VC. Uh, it was more the clean tech sector. Uh, started to be uh, interested by the, the food uh, business. So the, all, the co all the investors invest, hab having invested in solar, wind, uh, biomass, etc. And, and who took the, the big uh, uh, boom uh, in 2008 with the, the, the crisis and the, 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 the Chinese dumping and the solar panels. And especially and but also on the biomass, so agriculture uh, for biofuels a, a, a huge collapse, a lot of Silicon Valley companies disappeared, uh, hundreds of millions disappeared. And, uh, and the, the one example of one company in another uh, um, protein alternatives uh, called uh, Solazyme, uh, been to IPO, uh, valued more than 1 billion or maybe 2 billion uh, on biofuels for algae, uh, algae uh, going to, to the biodiesel. And at some point, the pivot to food and selling omega-3 uh, in food and feed. They did it, but too late, because they, they were bankrupted and acquired just at 20 million by Corbion uh, last year or two years ago, from 2 billion to 20 million. You see the, the crash. Um, so we, they were invest so investors educated to the, the, this commodity-driven market, so energies and similarities with agriculture, going to bioenergies or bioplastics, starting to be interested by this uh, other angles are maybe more uh, profitable or more certain, less impacted by the fossil fuel volatility. Uh, so we had Demeter, the, the French VC, uh, typical, typical uh, example, who invested in our first round uh, with Emertech, who actually joined. Uh, and quick after, the uh, new protein capital from Singapore joined also, so they were one of the, the, the first starting in this specialized in food uh, a few years ago. Uh, and we, are, we, are, we see now a, a much, much bigger uh, uh, trend and also Demeter closed uh, a new fund dedicated to bioeconomy in general, so mainly food and ag. Uh, so we were still in VC world, uh, free third round with uh, BPI and Aquadia, a group of fam uh, family group also, uh, more family offices behind this fund and impact driven fund, so not far from the clean tech sector, impact. Uh, we invested for instance in France in La Roche-Kidewi. And, and the last one was a bit different, the one few weeks ago, because we, we are at the end of the VC world, uh, because we, we are really in massive manufacturing uh, and, and in sizes, in terms of tickets, uh, uh, very high, but also a bit too early for private equity, because we, don't, we are not uh, EBITDA positive or, or at least generating a, a lot of cash. So what so do you we do? Were just in the middle of the, this... Uh, and this valley of depth, so we, we couldn't have access to uh, hundreds of investors uh, in VCs, or hundreds or thousands in, in PE. Uh, but we, 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 we found that investors really believing, of also having this vision uh, of impact and, and being a bit... Some of them are still uh, late stage VC. We have ID Invest, uh, who joined recently in BPE Large Venture in France. So they are also uh, uh, late stage VC. It's the segment of growth. Uh, uh, Growth uh, is typically the, this segment. And you have more and more VC going to the growth uh, segment and P going uh, uh, backward also to Yeah, the bridging growth. the gap Bri to, bridge to bridge handle this the gap situation. Of like a 10 uh, to 100 million ticket or at least one fund being built to a fund like 20 or 30, 40, 50 million ticket alone. Um, and so we see funds, VC funds going, building this growth fund like ID Invest or very large uh, PE funds in the, in the Valley, like uh, Silver Peak, doing growth uh, funds. So we, but still, manufacturing uh, is, is something, uh, uh, not software, so you don't have the, that much uh, bandwidth in, in uh, investors. Uh, Second, so in food and ag, with all the alias of the living organisms, that's something a lot of investors don't understand. 
and finally France still, uh, even though we have a lot of new things uh, for international investors, it's still not super easy to invest in France. Still, even if it's changed a lot uh, in the past five years, it's not the main, uh, it's not obvious for a lot of investors also. Oh, it's, uh, even though we, we, we close with French, but also Belgium, UK, so it's, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, so we managed to have a quite broad uh, uh, investor, I would say, uh, uh, portfolio, but still it's not uh, combining uh, heavy manufacturing, capital intensive, uh, uh, food, ag, uh, uh, alias of the living organisms and uh, in France, it's not the best, I would say, uh, combination you could do yeah. <laughs> to raise funds. <laughs> you, could do, you could do better. Uh, but still, I mean, the, with, the, with the trend today, with more and more VCs in the food, la, la, like five seasons, more and more entrepreneurs also, uh, and overall the French tax is having this very uh, really large now part of uh, startups raising from one to 10 million and going now. More, we see more and more uh, rounds from 10 to 50, and we start to see now uh, more rounds above uh, 50 millions. That's showing the, the maturity of the overall French tech seg segments. Yeah. And the food is still very small in this, but it's, it's, it's growing. And we, I'm pretty convinced that we, in France, agriculture and food is one of the key uh, skills and, uh, and knowledge uh, for savoir-faire uh, savoir yeah. from centuries. Yeah. Uh, so we, we can really handle on this. We have from farmers to chef uh, and to very big corporates in, be in between. Uh, we have something, we could be uh, world leaders in this area of the new food and new ag. And uh, I'm pretty sure we will never build this uh, new, uh, new Facebook, a uh, new platform like, uh, as big as Facebook because we are not as good as marketing as in the US, but we are super, super good in, uh, in food and ag. We're super good in luxuries, uh, in some industries also uh, in mathematics. So we should also focus on in areas where we have the best schools, best knowledge and best savoir-faire. Yeah. So a very ending on a, on a very positive note. The, the last thing before I open up question to you guys is if in a couple of words each you could give uh, one piece of advice to your young self starting a company in food tech, what would it be? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think today, as you say before, uh, food tech yeah, are very, uh, very big traction. There are a lot of challenge, so a lot of to do. Uh, uh, so I, I don't really know how to say as <laughs> so focus on the use of the on the challenge and um, uh, food food tech is very changing from now uh, as you can see there are a lot of uh, industrial uh, uh, issues and uh, we have to focus what deserve to to be invest what is of to be controlled and what is not because there are a lot of knowledge as you say before and uh, and and point the, 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 uh, uh, the good thing we need to be uh, controlled. Um, so I will, t I will say the food is a sector which is really very, very competitive. Uh, so do not um, uh, afraid <laughs> of uh, competitive landscape. You need to really be focused on uh, what you want to achieve, what you want to uh, you, you need to be focused on your goal and you need to, you, you need to keep um, progressing. This is, this is very important, I think. And also, uh, again, about the food sector, if you, are, you want to uh, launch a new product and if it, is, if it needs cool storage or cool distribution, it is a very important issue. Uh, you really need to be uh, also thinking about how you will uh, deliver your product. It is really very important because you can have a, a very good product, but if you can't really uh, put it uh, in front of the consumer, then you, you can't really sell your product. So it is, it is very important. <laughs> I have two, but quick. The first one is hire someone who's better than you or partner with someone who's better than you and different from you. And the second is uh, ask yourself the question, what's, what's my unfair advantage? compared to others. Thanks. I intriguing. Uh, um, um, indeed, higher always better than you. Uh, for me, maybe one personal advice, don't uh, try to have a baby while you are doing, closing a deal. <laughs> it's not a good, good idea. <laughs> what, I, what I did, <laughs> try to separate things. <laughs> and more seriously, uh, again, be ambitious. Be ambitious, target huge, huge things. 
It's how you will make an impact, either if you are willing to make positive environmental impact, social impact, economic impact, even better if you do the three of them. Uh, for us, in our case, we, we, we are not shy to say that in the next 10 or 15 years, we want to make a 5 billion revenues. Uh, it's really uh, a metrics with uh, uh, this number of factories, at least 15 in these places in the world, etc. And it will be only 0.5% of the feed and fertilizer market in 10 years. So we are only, so target also big markets, big needs, and, uh, and, and then execute. The key is execution, the team, the good team, the good hires. And just to add one thing, I think it's very important to, to think global because the uh, food challenge is very wide and uh, uh, it, uh, it requires so, so much uh, things, so much skill and so much uh, consequences. So think global uh, from the, uh, what you need to, f to do it and uh, what it uh, represents for the consumer. Thank you. So I want to, first of all, thank our amazing panel. This has been super, super interesting. It's really thanks to entrepreneurs like you guys um, that we managed to have a thriving ecosystem. Uh, and I also uh, want to point out, I think I saw Victor, who's at the back, yes, who's working at Supreme, who's reinventing foie gras um, using uh, cellular technology. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for coming during lunch and hope you guys will stick around. We have some very low-tech food uh, at the back. So thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoyed it. Give a thank big you. round of applause. Please.